very much for the introduction. Thank you all for the gracious invitation to, to come here and give this talk. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm coming here to tell you about the neutrino. Um, that I'm still young enough that that feels like a slightly audacious thing to, to come to this group um, where so many chapters of the neutrino have been written um, to tell you about some of its properties. Uh, but I guess what I hope to convey to you today is that um, in addition to all the work that you're doing here, the neutrino is a very interesting particle. There's a lot of unwritten material in that book on how it works uh, and how it fits into our model of physics. So personally, why I study the neutrino. I study the neutrino because it's intersectional, because I don't have to choose what type of physics I get to do. I get to dabble between particle and nuclear physics and think about astrophysics-y things. Um, the neutrino is an enigmatic particle. It has a lot of unanswered questions, and those unanswered questions sit at the intersections of those fields. Um, and I hope to kind of bring some of these themes together in the talk today. OK, so what do I mean by that? I mean that if you go up and you look at the night sky, it's beautiful. Astronomers do a really good job of taking pretty pictures. It's what got some of us interested in physics in the first place. Um, but you can go up and look at the night sky, and I'm twisted enough that I see neutrinos there. Um, and, and I'll explain why that is in the coming slides. Um, when you try and make sense of the universe, when we try and make sense of it, one of the, the best tools we have is to apply the standard model of particle physics, right? That's how we generate a self-consistent picture of physics from the ground up. And when you do that, you find that the neutrino is sitting right there. Um, and it, it fits nicely into our grid. You know, We've got our three generations. We've got our charged leptons and our neutral leptons, right? Neutrino, it's a done story, right? It, we should be doing quite well. Um, the problem is that the neutrino, it does fit very well into the standard model, but it doesn't fit in a necessarily complete or satisfying way. Um, you know, All of the other fundamental fermions are charged, so they have different interactions in the neutrino. The neutrino has a weird set of interactions relative to everything else. Uh, the neutrino is the only uh, uncharged particle. It's also the only particle whose mass we don't know yet. And that is actually even more bothersome when you consider that what we know about the neutrino, originally it was supposed to be this uncharged particle in the standard model. Uh, and it was only after some uh, very important measurements that we got a better handle of it. OK, so to make this broadly accessible, I'm going to take a few steps back. Uh, and I'm going to remind you about a few key markers along the history of the neutrino. So first of all, the neutrino was postulated in 1930 by Wolfgang Pauli. You look at this continuous beta spectrum and you say, yep, that's a continuous spectrum. And in order to preserve uh, energy conservation, uh, an additional particle in the decay was postulated by Pauli. Um, he wrote this lovely telegram in 1930. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. Um, it's rather humorous. Um, but the key features for this talk are that Pauli comes up with this desperate remedy. He wants to preserve conservation of energy. Um, and if you follow his remedy, you make the continuous beta spectrum make sense. But what does it require? It requires the existence of a new particle. So right from the beginning, uh, the neutrino has been fundamentally linked to the beta spectrum and beta decay. Um, Pauli also recognized at the time exactly what he was doing. Um, he was not making it easy uh, because he didn't have a mechanism whereby this particle could be detected. Um, but it didn't take very long for other physicists to take the baton from Pauli um, and figure out how the neutrino should fit in with the rest of physics. So uh, Enrico Fermi in the 30s, just a few years later, uh, was writing down his theory of the weak interaction, um, or what became the theory of the weak interaction. Uh, he had this nice interaction. Uh, which could explain beta decay with the emission of these neutrinos. Uh, and in those same seminal papers, which got rejected from Nature, by the way, if you ever feel bad about a journal rejection, um, <laughs> he noted that the presence of this neutrino impacts the endpoint of the decay spectrum. Uh, so this is you know, about 90 years ago. Uh, and this is the method that I'm going to be telling you about later in this talk about how we go out and measure the neutrino mass. So you go in and you look at the endpoint of the spectrum, and if it has one shape, that is telling you that the neutrino is a massless particle. Um, and depending on what the mass is, you will see a different shape distortion when you look at the endpoint of the beta spectrum. 
OK, so that's great. In the 30s, we already know what we have to go out and do. We just have to go out and do it. So how hard is it to measure neutrinos? Anybody who does this knows the answer. Ridiculously hard, right? Um, you can fast forward to the 50s when Rhinus and Cowan were trying to measure the neutrinos for the first time. Um, their brilliant idea for how to measure the neutrinos involved dropping a nuke and then dropping a detector in an evacuated vacuum uh, so that it was decoupled from the ground waves and could measure these neutrinos. Answer, hard, very hard. Um, this actually still doesn't get you to the sensitivity that you need. Um, they didn't actually measure the neutrinos this way. Uh, they figured out that with some background suppressions, there was a slightly more clever way to do it. Um, namely, they went to Savannah River to a nuclear reactor. Um, if you can do the tagging correctly, you can reject a whole lot of your backgrounds and see the very faint neutrino signal. Um, word of advice, if you do make one of these groundbreaking measurements, always make sure to go back and claim your case of champagne because uh, that's what they did. Wolfgang Pauli made a bet that it couldn't be, uh, that he didn't know how it was gonna be detectable. Um, and so when they, uh, when they actually made the discovery, they sent a telegram to Pauli um, telling him that. They had done it. Okay, so fast forward a whole bunch of years. We know that neutrinos are incredibly hard to measure. Um, this is something that's familiar to this audience. Uh, the scale of the neutrino experiments that we've done to go after this has changed quite a lot. Uh, over those intervening decades, but toward these, the end of the 90s and into the 2000s, um, these were sort of the premier experiments uh, which then earned a Nobel Prize in 2015 uh, and proved something really bizarre, right? That you can start with neutrinos of one flavor, they can transform to neutrinos of other flavors, um, and they relate to these fundamental properties of neutrinos. Um, mixing uh, angles, which tell you how to mix between the states, uh, delta m squareds, which tell you something about the mass, but they don't tell you everything that you want to know about the mass. Uh, and that sets the scale uh, for where this research is going. Now, uh, neutrinos are not limited to a pure nuclear physics problem, like understanding fusion in the sun. They're not tied to atmospheric uh, phenomena, like the, the mixing uh, that's observed by super K. Neutrinos are everywhere. They're the second most abundant particle in the universe. Um, they're important in low energy. If you can ever go out and measure cosmological neutrinos, they're important in very high energy for multi-messenger astronomy. Um, that makes them a really interesting particle to study. Um, and the thing that I'm telling you about today, trying to understand their mass, is just one small piece of this broader puzzle. So if we tally up what we know about neutrinos in the standard model, we get a few things. Um, first of all, going back to Pauli, in order for them to fit into beta decay, they have to be chargeless, they have to be spin one half. We've since learned more things about them. They only interact via the weak force and gravity. Um, that's why they're so hard to measure. Uh, they're only observed as left-handed particles. It's part of the motivation for them being massless. Um, and what that mass is, we don't know. They're the only fundamental particles in the standard model that we don't know their mass of. Um, we're just sitting at upper limits. Um, that's what we're out to do. But it's not just an esoteric, I've got to fill in my last bubble in my crossword in order to consider it complete. Um, the fact that they have mass and that we don't know what that mass is, it's actually tied to a lot of other interesting questions. Um, from a purely schematic level, the neutrino mass doesn't make sense, right? If you line up all of your fundamental fermions, heck, throw in the bosons too, it's about six orders of magnitude in span. It's about six orders of magnitude from the electron to where the neutrinos might appear in the mass ordering. They're incredibly suppressed in their mass. It's one of the reasons that it's hard to go out and measure. Um, so, so that's trying to beckon you to maybe there's a different mechanism, underlying physics mechanism that's driving their mass. Um, and then if you try to start invoking theories for why this might be, you start proposing experiments like neutrinoless double beta decay, um, which can uncover their fundamental nature if it's a Majorana particle. Um, that then leads to new sources of CP violation in the lepton sector that connects to all of cosmology in terms of why is there a matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Um, so this is 
what I started with. The neutrino is an incredibly intersectional particle, and we want to know the answers to this one particular question, diving very deep, um, because it has these broader impacts on a whole lot of other questions that we want to answer. Okay, and then the other thing, right, is that the neutrino oscillation experiments, by measuring this delta m squared, they tell us something about the mass, but they don't tell us everything. Specifically, they're telling us what the splittings are, but not this absolute scale. So we can't constrain the absolute mass of the neutrino just based on the oscillation experiments alone. Um, there's other questions like whether which uh, mass ordering universe we live in. Um, that's uh, typically the playground of the long baseline accelerator experiments. We have hope of seeing that in the next generation of experiments too, because it's a great confusing mess right now. Um, and so the US has recently gone through a couple of different exercises for our fields to determine you know, what are the big science driver questions that we'd like to answer. Um, within the particle physics community, the question of neutrino mass uh, is one of the most important questions. It's one of the five science drivers for all of particle physics. Uh, neutrino mass, because of its relation to these other questions, also ends up <coughs> tied into the questions of dark matter uh, in terms of particle interactions. Um, so it's very high up there on the particle physics questions we want to answer. Um, in the nuclear physics community, we just had a new long-range plan that got released last month. Um, in that plan, neutrino double beta decay was one of the highest priorities, partly because it tells you things about the scale of the mass. Um, but what I'm going to tell you about today is focusing, like drilling down in how you can unambiguously do that. Um, which is going to require absolute measurements and not things that are tied to the theory uh, like neutrinos double beta decay. <coughs> okay, so that's the whirlwind intro. You can interrupt me at any time if you have questions. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep talking because I'm a physicist and that's what we do when we get in front of an audience. <laughs> okay, so how do you, given that question, you want to know about the absolute mass scale of the neutrino, how do you do it? And there are three tools that we have. The first is cosmology. Um, we have one lovely universe in which to live, um, and it turns out that there's a rich amount of information when we make cosmological probes. At lightning round, you make a very sensitive microwave telescope, you study the CMB sky, you map it out, and you see the temperature fluctuations in that sky, and those temperature fluctuations tell you, well, many things, but as a neutrino physicist, I'm particularly <coughs> interested in what it tells me about the neutrino mass and the number of neutrino flavors. Um, but uh, neutrinos come in as a kind of dark matter uh, because they're weakly interacting, uh, but because they're very low mass, they form a type of warm dark matter instead of the traditional cold wimp dark matter. So this is what our universe should look like based on simulation. This is what our universe would look like if we make the neutrino too massive. We have too much warm dark matter, um, and so by placing a constraint on how much of this very fine filamentary structure we actually have in the universe, you can make a constraint on the sum of the neutrino masses. And it turns out that cosmology gives us the most sensitive constraints of any of the probes at this point, although arguably they're the most model dependent. So why don't we just say that uh, cosmology gives us everything? Well, there's the model dependence. There's also the fact that neutrino mass is not part of the base six parameter lambda CDM model. It actually has to get added as an auxiliary parameter. Once you start adding parameters, where do you stop adding the new physics? Um, so if you can constrain the neutrino mass independently, you've constrained one of the inputs to cosmology. We only get one cosmology. Uh, so the more physics we can get out of it by having the more direct constraints, um, the better off we are. Um, also, I've plotted here the sum of the neutrino masses against the Hubble constant. If you follow cosmology, you know that the Hubble constant is not, everything is not well with the Hubble constant. <laughs> um, so this is the Hubble constant according to CMB probes. Uh, the Hubble constant according to type one supernovae uh, is somewhere, depending on who you ask, five sigma discrepant. Um, you put a couple of astrophysicists and cosmologists in a room and you bait them with this question and then you close the door um, and interesting stuff happens. Um, <laughs> the point is, in addition to this model dependence that's associated with cosmology, there are questions of whether we actually have a complete and consistent cosmological model at this point. Um, we would like that 
obviously, right? We're physicists, we want to know everything about all the things we study. Um, and so the more external constraints you can put in on this, um, the better we can understand what these tensions are telling us about maybe other new physics that we, we didn't even know we were supposed to be going after and looking at. Uh, so that's cosmology in a nutshell. Uh, we can also get at the neutrino mass through neutrinos double beta decay searches. This is something that this audience, I'm sure, is very familiar with. Um, you take a particular nucleus that, due to the pairings of the nucleons, is energetically forbidden to decay one over, but is allowed to decay two over. And you get this standard model allowed double beta decay process. It's got a half-life of round figures 10 to the 20 years, so it's really hard to measure. Um, that's why it took 50 years after Maria Gobert Meyer postulated it before it was first measured. Um, but now we've actually gotten quite good at this. We've measured it in about 10 isotopes. Um, and then we say, that's not hard enough. I'd really like something more challenging as an experiment to go after. Um, and so you look for this process where there are no neutrinos emitted, um, and that's gonna have a very different signature experimentally, right? Neutrinos are carrying away energy here. Oops, sorry. So you get this broad beta-like spectrum. Here, the electrons carry all the energy, and so you get a sharp peak at the endpoint. That's something that, as an experimentalist, makes me very happy um, because I can go out and measure it. Um, and if you measure it, you measure the half-life. That half-life, or the rate, is related to the mass scale of whatever new physics you put here. Typically, we take the simplistic interpretation of it being light Meyer on a neutrino exchange, um, but you can ask a theorist to give you something more interesting to play with. And um, I'm biased. Maybe I shouldn't have done this because Ryan Martin isn't here today. Uh, I also work in the Germanian double beta decay field. So you can think of this as progressing from last generation experiments to sort of current generation experiments to next generation experiments. We're trying to scale this up by orders of magnitude of sensitivity. You can make the same plot for snow, although it doesn't scale in size, it scales in loading. Um, but there's a number of different ways that we're going at this. Okay, what's the problem with this? If all you care about is the neutrino mass, this is the wrong way to do it. Because you will only measure this process if this process happens. And there's no guarantee in the physics that this process happens. You can make arguments of why it's natural and why it should happen. Um, and if you measure it, it tells you something fundamentally about why the scale is what it is. So it's an incredibly important probe to follow. It's why it's one of the top priorities in the US nuclear physics community but you could search forever and not measure it. Um, and I'm young, I, I'd like to have something that I can actually measure within my career. So that leads me to the last method of going after this, uh, the endpoint measurements, specifically beta spectrum measurements, but also electron capture. So what's special about these is that they really address the neutrino mass problem in a direct and model independent way. So with approximately no theory uncertainty, we can extract the neutrino mass from these searches. And I already told you the punchline for how this happens. You go back to Fermi's paper from 1934, you look at the endpoint and you look for distortions in the spectrum of the betas. Um, we actually know this isn't quite right because properly speaking, there are three neutrino flavors. Um, and so when we're looking at electron neutrinos or antineutrinos in the beta decay, um, those are actually superpositions of different quant of mass states of the neutrino. Um, so if you have exquisite resolution, you can actually measure uh, the different kinks from the turnoffs of these individual contributions to the spectrum. But at a napkin level, this is the search you're doing. You're looking for the distortions in the spectrum from a non-zero neutrino mass which folds it from this beautifully quadratic falling off spectrum to this thing that's going to turn over. And at no energy resolution, it's a really easy problem. If you also, if you don't think about the statistics it takes. So how do you go about and do this? Well, you need to choose an isotope that has a low enough endpoint energy that you're actually going to get countably, countable number of statistics in the endpoint region. And so for that reason, tritium has been sort of the workhorse of the field. Uh, for most of the last 75 years. Um, it goes back to uh, a paper in the late 40s uh, uh, by a scientist at Indiana University. Indiana University also, long before my time, was involved in some of the early searches for neutrino mass. Um, 
but the technique hasn't really changed. We're still following Fermi's form formula for how we're going to extract this from the endpoint of the spectrum. Um, your highlight reel on what tritium is, it has an endpoint energy of 18.6 keV, so that's fairly low as beta decay isotopes go. It has a half-life of 12 years. That's fairly convenient as experiments go because it's roughly stable over an experiment timeline um, and yet also not totally burdened by a lot of inert isotope that's not going to decay for you, like, I don't know, we in the neutrino and this double beta decay community have to deal with. Um, also, the nuclear theory is really nice. You go from two neutrons and a proton to two protons and a neutron, that's a super allowed decay. We can exactly calculate um, what that spectrum should look like and have no theoretical uncertainties on our extraction. Um, so that's what the spectrum should look like. And recall, we're specifically zooming in only on the endpoint region, you know, a region that's comparable to the mass scale, a little bit larger than the mass scale that we're hunting for. Okay, that's where we're going. The current state of the art in this field is the Katrin experiment. Disclaimer, I don't work on Katrin, um, but it's an exquisitely designed and executed experiment. Um, this is what it looks like. It's about 70 meters from one end to the other. Um, you have a very intense tritium source here, which uh, gives you all the electron decays. Those electrons are then guided through various parts of this apparatus to a focal plane detector, which is just a counting detector. Um, lots of transport and pumping so you can reduce it and make sure that there's no tritium that's getting into your spectrometer. That causes really bad backgrounds. Um, the spectrometer, the size of the spectrometer sets the energy resolution. Um, and you have a filter here so that it's a high pass filter and only electrons that are above a certain energy are collected on your detector. Uh, where Katrin is right now, uh, so up to this point, we've seen the first two campaigns of data. Um, it took them about a month of data at like 5% of their tritium intensity to break the previous world uh, best limit. Uh, then they released campaign two data. Uh, this is the first sub-EV limit. Uh, we've been waiting a couple of years on this one. Uh, I've been promised uh, at Taup last, a couple months ago, that this data is unblinded. It's coming soon. I'm really excited to see it. Um, they're still working out a couple of kinks in the Krypton spectrum, I understand. Um, but we're going to get a lot more data. Um, and then there's a lot more data that's actually in the bag already, uh, waiting to be released. Uh, so Katrin has just a wealth of information, um, and you should definitely stay tuned uh, for what their limits are going to do, um, improving with all of these additional statistics and improved systematics. Um, what they publish looks like this. Um, so here you see the run one and the run two data. Um, run one was at slightly lower rate, slightly higher background, run two uh, was much improved because of the lower background and higher statistics from their source. Um, every one of these points is a spectrometer potential um, where they're just counting the, ca the number of events they get above that point. Um, and so then they can apply a fit and extract the neutrino mass from this. It's brilliantly executed, has very good design to balance its systematic and statistical uncertainties. Um, it's going to continue plowing down and being the best in the world um, until somebody supplants it, and that's many years away. The problem is that this experiment will run out of steam eventually, and if you want to do something better than Katrin, you would have to do something significantly bigger than Katrin. Um, I don't know, something like an order of magnitude in diameter relative to this very large vacuum vessel. Um, that's not really a tractable problem. Um, so scaling for the next generation experiment is a real problem. And it's the problem that I'm going to spend the rest of the talk addressing how you can get around. Um, so in perspective, this is the M beta, the parameter that we're measuring in, the, in these experiments versus the sum of the neutrino masses, which is what cosmology measures. Um, Katrin is now here. They're going to continue grinding down about another f uh, factor of four. Um, that's really hard. You're, Statistical sensitivity improves like the fourth root of the number of decays. So you double your uh, statistics and you get almost peanuts uh, for your improved sensitivity. Um, so you really need to do something significantly different if you want to go from here and probe an entire ordering region. 
There's an additional challenge uh, which is related to the source of the experiment. So Katrin has used the, this molecular tritium source. I'm gonna talk about the limitations here. Uh, it bites you in both systematic and statistics ways, um, about a factor of two beyond where Katrin is reaching. Uh, and by the end of the talk, I hope that you will be at least moderately interested in an experiment uh, which can do a factor of five in sensitivity better and gets you past the inverted ordering. So it will, if you measure the neutrino mass, uh, above that, you're good. If you don't measure it, you've shown that the neutrino is definitely normal ordering. Okay, so how do we do this? The answer is, first of all, uh, not this way, because that's not a path to scaling. Um, but you can actually get some interesting ideas about how to do this by looking at Katrin. So in Katrin, you take electrons from somewhere way down here, and you have them oscillating around magnetic field lines, until they smack your spectrometer. And if you ask the question, well, what if your entire volume were this spectrometer? You wouldn't instrument it this way. Those electrons are cycling around magnetic field lines. As they cycle around electric magnetic field lines, sorry, um, they are, those cyclotron orbits are associated with cyclotron radiation. So if you can measure the frequency of that cyclotron radiation, you can infer things about the kinematics of those electrons. Um, and this is a good idea because we're really good at making high precision frequency measurements. You know, you can take an RF system, you can mix down frequencies, get them in a band that's useful to you, um, and then do experiments that are at sort of part per million level. Um, and we've demonstrated this with a number of probes like muon G minus two, electron G minus uh, two. Frequency measurements are a great way to go for precision. Okay. It hinges on the fact that these electrons are not classical. This small kinetic energy with respect to their rest mass is still enough that we produce a relativistic shift in the cyclotron frequency. So if you think about from zero energy electrons down to roughly the tritium endpoint, um, it's about a gigahertz shift on a 26 gigahertz signal. Um, so there's plenty of room there then to kind of dig down and get the energy resolution that we need um, to at sub EV measure the resolution of these uh, electrons. And all it takes is decay electrons and a magnetic field and an RF system that can measure them. Okay, so the experiment in brief, uh, before I joined it, there was phase one. They made the first demonstration that you could actually measure electrons like this. Um, it was the first time anybody had done it. It required, you know, sort of modern level uh, low noise amplifiers. Um, what I'll spend a chunk of time talking about in this talk is phase two. Um, these are results that we just published earlier this year in PRL. Um, we improved the phase one measurements uh, using Krypton. We got better energy resolution. Um, and we did the first measurement with tritium, so this is now the first RF-based tritium mass, or sorry, neutrino mass tritium endpoint measurement. Um, and we did a bunch of demonstrations that are important to sort of forecast how this technology goes ahead to future generations. Um, so those results are now published. Um, and then where we're turning to is a whole bunch of R&D demonstrators that will tell us how exactly the technology scales to the experiment that we want to build. That experiment that we want to build is many years out, um, and we certainly have our work cut out for us. Um, but ultimately, we can start to piece together the conceptual and technical design for what that experiment should look like. Okay, so the phase two measurements that I said I would tell you about, um, this is a paper, it just came out in PRL in September. Um, there was a nice highlight, uh, so if you want the gory details look here. If you want the really gory details, look at the one that's going into PRC. Um, if you just want the coffee table version, uh, look at the synopsis. Um, how does an experiment like this work? Uh, you need a source of your magnetic field because that's what sets the cyclotron frequency of these electrons. Um, so that sets where you're measuring. You need a source of decay electrons. Um, that's either krypton or tritium. Um, and then you need some RF readout. Uh, these signals are at 26 gigahertz, uh, so that was specifically chosen so that it was paired to commercial uh, frequencies uh, to then read out, digitize, and look at our signals. This experiment fundamentally is, you know, it's roughly a tabletop scale experiment. 
if you have a lab with really high CLX, um, right? But the sensitive volume is buried right in here, whole bunch of infrastructure for it, but it's you know, comparably sized to a graduate student. Um, even if the time scale for making the measurement is not always comparably sized to a graduate student's lifetime. Um, the size is small. The sensitive volume of this detector is, you know, actually roughly the size of this laser pointer. The waveguide is a centimeter in diameter and it's like six inches long. Um, so whole bunch of infrastructure for not a whole lot of space to do your experiment in. But when you put this uh, system together, this is what you measure. So here you see in time and frequency space, so we, we take a digitization and then we Fourier transform it so we can see uh, where the power is in frequency space. You get a single electron which is born in your trap. The electron slowly radiates cyclotron power, so all of these lines are sloped up as they lose energy. Um, and then it's punctuated by a series of abrupt jumps where it scatters on residual gas. Um, what we want from this for the mo to reasonable approximation is just this starting point um, because that encodes the initial energy of the electron when we first measured it. Um, and we don't really care about how the electron loses energy. We care about what energy it was born with. So by measuring hundreds or thousands or millions of these things, we then put them together into a spectrum. And that spectrum looks like this. Um, I could give a whole technical talk on what goes into this spectrum. Um, this is the main peak energy resolution. Um, most of that width is actually dictated by the natural line width of the Krypton source that we're using. Um, with actually fairly marginal broadening from our instrumental resolution. Uh, there's a long low energy tail to this. Uh, there's two components to that. Some of it is related to atomic physics, to the shake up and shake off electrons in the source. Um, and some of it is related to the fact that you don't always measure this electron before it scatters. And so if it's scattered off of the gas, um, then you will always measure it in a shifted uh, energy. If you have to have a tail, you want the tail on the low energy side, right? Because that spills down into the higher statistics part of your tritium spectrum where uh, those effects are just less critical. If you have the tail going on the high energy side, um, then that starts to mess with where you're trying to see that turnover in the spectrum to extract the neutrino mass. Okay, just for fun, this is you know, the typical spectrogram that we show. Uh, because it's nice and well behaved. Not all spectrograms look like this. Um, some spectrograms look like this. So here you can see one very long track. Um, this lasts for about 10 milliseconds. But down here, there's some fuzzing above and below. Um, so it turns out that your main track is this nice sharp line. And if you have a slight misalignment, um, you start to see other aspects of the electron's motion. Specifically, these electrons are not just perfectly well-behaved sitting in the middle of your trap uh, you know, doing what we want them to do. They're actually bouncing around. They have to be magnetically confined, and that leads to motion in all three dimensions, not just this cyclotron frequency that sets the main carrier, but this axial frequency through Doppler shifts modulates the signal that you see and produces these sidebands. Um, so if you can measure these sidebands, they're telling you things about the kinematics of the electron in the trap, which actually become very important in later phases uh, for doing the highest precision corrections to get the best energy resolution. Uh, sometimes they bite you because sometimes you measure a track that looks like this and your eyes aren't deceiving you. There is no main carrier in this um, because it got sucked up into the Doppler. Um, and so all we see in this first track, in this first set, uh, are the first order side bands. Um, and so depending on the configuration of your experiment, you have to contend with things like that. Um, we learned a lot from running phase two about all of the aspects of how you extract the necessary information from these spectrograms. Um, and so those are things that are gonna apply forward when we think about what we want the next generation experiment to look like. Uh, Cress is really quite well behaved over a wide frequency range and thus a wide energy range. So in this apparatus, just by tuning where our RF filters are, we can shift between what part of the spectrum we're looking at. Um, and in fact, we're blind to the parts that we don't want to look at, so we don't have to worry about pileup related to it. Um, but in this demonstration, we looked at the 17.8 keV electrons. We also looked at 
the electrons that are over 30 keV from these decays. Um, they're showing up where we wanted them to. They're well behaved over a wide frequency range. Um, this is one of the checks we want to do because the tritium spectrum, of course, is continuous. So we want to make sure that the technique is well behaved over that wide range. Um, so what am I happy about from that result? Well, we made the first tritium measurement using this technique. Uh, it took three months. Uh, we measured all of 4,000 counts, so we're pretty starved on statistics. Um, but once you go through all the work of doing the full analysis, um, you see a shape to this spectrum which is very consistent uh, with the expectation once you fold in all of the weird quirks of the RF system that give you weird kinks in it. Um, as you design future experiments, you definitely don't want to design kinks into this, but as a cross-check for now, we're pretty happy that we saw that. That allows you to extract a neutrino mass limit. Um, it allows you to extract the endpoint of the spectrum. The endpoint is consistent with literature. The neutrino mass limit is not world leading, but it's the first one with an RF technique. And the background is non-existent but beyond the endpoint, at least at the statistical precision we have right now. Um, and that's promising because any backgrounds we have beyond the endpoint are gonna be things that we really have to understand uh, for future neutrino mass extraction. Okay, so that's where we've come to up to this point. Um, it's not a world leading limit, but it's very promising telling us where this technology is going. So what is that path forward? So first of all, we invented a totally new spectroscopic technique. That's fun, it's really hard because it means that you can't just go into the literature and ask how to solve the problems you have. But at the same time, there are other experiments that are taking this technology um, trying to understand uh, and improve our nuclear data, uh, looking for beyond the standard model in other decays like helium-6, um, looking for cosmic relic neutrinos. Uh, Ptolemy essentially uses a, a version of crest tagging. Um, so it's fun that the, as the technology matures, um, we're actually getting partners in the field uh, who can start to solve some of our problems for us. Um, and, and that we can go hand in hand improving this. But really, I came here to drill deep in the neutrino mass. So where does that path lead? Um, so we would like to figure out how to get uh, a neutrino mass sensitivity of 40 millielectron volts. Um, so if you're keeping track in your head, that's about a factor of 4,000, better than we are currently. Um, the, precision, the statistical precision improves with the fourth root of the number of decays. So if you take 4,000 to the fourth power, that um, let's not do that. Um, okay, so uh, what that experiment should look like, um, we need a couple of ingredients. We need a very large detector, tens of cubic meters of effective volume times years of uh, sensitivity. Um, and we need everything to be done in atomic tritium to remove uh, those systematic and statistical limits that Kotrin will eventually run up against. And that's kind of depicted in this plot. So here you can see the, um, well, this is the preferred axis because it's telling you the neutrino mass limit in electron volts, um, where the current world best is sitting about here. Kotrin will get to about here. And we want to get uh, down here, or sorry, down to here, ultimately. We're starting back over here. We need to jump all the way up to here. So that's going to require exposure, and it's going to require atomic tritium. OK, so there's roughly two parallel paths that Project 8 is pursuing um, to perform this R&D. Uh, first of all, scaling of the Crest detectors um, and making them better. So the first step along the way is uh, switching from waveguide detection to cavities. Cavities are gonna buy us a couple of things. Uh, the resonant enhancement gives us better signal to noise ratio. Um, the way you observe them gives you better sideband structure, which also improves your SNR. Um, so we hope to use cavities then to improve the resolution. We've got about EV scale resolution. We'd like to knock that down to be significantly sub EV um, so that we can reasonably talk, be talking about the distortions that a 40 milli electron volt electron is putting on the spectrum. Um, this is not, that's like a factor of, of almost two. Uh, it's not gonna get you the exposure you need. 
So you also need to make these cavities much bigger. This cavity is fundamentally limited because it's using the same magnetic field as the last generation experiment. Um, so we want to change the field, which changes the frequency, which changes the fundamental length scale of our cavity. Um, and that's going to buy us a lot in terms of the volume. So in parallel with this one, which is targeting better resolution in our first cavity, we're also targeting a huge jump in the frequency field and volume that, uh, that one of these cavities can do. And so each of these is going to take you know, a couple of years to figure out all of the quirks and the things we didn't expect. Um, but then you can envision these coming together into a large volume, high resolution cavity. Um, and then you can start talking about what does the experiment actually look like at scale, um, sort of 10 <coughs> cubic meter scale, uh, where this cross section is set by the frequency that you're looking at. So you can't just make this arbitrarily large. So it ends up having an aspect ratio of about 10 to 1. Um, that's significantly lower in field. It's significantly lower in frequency. Getting your field homogeneity becomes significantly harder as you go to much lower fields. Um, so we are not without technical challenges. Um, but we're also not without lots of things to go out and tackle in the interim. Um, to give you a sense, uh, COVID put kind of a delay on a lot of the lab work. Um, this is the first cavity, well, actually, it's the first calibration source for the first cavity going into a large MRI magnet. You need a large bore so that then we can get this cool and get all of the trapping coils around it and all the infrastructure that we need. Um, but the pieces are starting to come together uh, for this next generation experiment, um, which we're going to run in Seattle. OK, that's half of our problems. The other half of our problems relate to the source. right? So you think about molecular tritium, you think about a decay of molecular tritium, and that electron is going to kick the molecule. And that molecule is going to wiggle, and it's going to rotate, and it's going to do, well, all of that rotational vibrational stuff that you really didn't want to think about. And that does two things for you. One, you have to understand the theory of the states that it can excite. And two, you have to understand the broadening that it's going to give you. So roughly speaking, if you have the molecule, you get sort of EV scale broadening. We're pushing to sub-EV resolution on our technique. We really don't want to eat EV scale broadening with little quirky peaks um, related to the different states that can get excited. So we don't have a choice. Going to the next generation, we need atomic tritium. Because atomic tritium, you kick it, and it just, you know, it's pure translational. Um, so if your tritium is cold, uh, you have essentially no broadening that you have to eat. Well, what does it take to get atomic tritium for your experiment? Um, if you think about this schematic, it starts with the production of atomic tritium. All of the hydrogen isotopes would like to bind. Uh, they want to form H2, T2, HT, whatever. Um, so when you get tritium, it's going to be in the molecular form. So the first thing you have to do is crack it. Um, traditionally, we've been using hot thermal crackle crackers at a few thousand Kelvin. Um, we've been working on this for a few years. After you produce this hot uh, tritium, ultimately, you want it trapped at high or modest densities in your sensitive volume. But you need to keep it off of the walls, because the walls are where it will recombine into the molecule and then give you not what you want. Um, so. Uh, in order to trap it, we're going to trap it magnetogravitationally like they do in the neutron decay experiments, um, like UCM tau. Um, that requires a temperature of about a millikelvin. Um, we know how to do these high multiple fields. It's just a question of engineering them correctly. You can do it with permanent magnets in a Halbach configuration, or you can do it with superconducting racetracks in, in a Yaffe configuration. Either way gives you a high multiple field. Um, which confines it at the walls and gives you a uniform field region in the middle. But right there's a, there's a gap. We start at 2,500 Kelvin. We want it to be at a millikelvin. So in between, it, it's going to take a whole lot of cooling. And it takes two different cooling steps to get it where you want. Um, you can start by cooling it collisionally off of cold walls. You can get that down very efficiently to 100 Kelvin um, with modest losses down to tens of Kelvin. But then you need another four orders of magnitude uh, through, we think, evaporative cooling. Um, so 
there's lots of R&D on all of the different aspects of this atomic beam line going on uh, to put the pieces together. But if you can get all of this together, then we actually have a pretty good idea of how this experiment has to come together. So we need many cubic meters, years of exposure. Um, we need a very high atomic tritium source, high flux source, um, so that we can get uh, the number densities of these tritium atoms that we need in our trap. We need excellent energy resolution so that we actually have the sensitivity to what that shape distortion at the endpoint is for a 40 milli electron volt electron. Um, and we need really good field uniformity um, where remember that that field uniformity is sitting on something like a 10 millitesla field. Um, so we need sort of nanotesla level uh, field uniformity and understanding. Um, interestingly, this also has the potential to measure the mass ordering, right? So these neutrino mass states, they produce kinks in the spectrum. Um, and if those if we have sufficient statistics and sufficient resolution to do the experiment that we're planning, um, you can actually see the distortion associated with, say, um, an inverted ordering kink structure versus a normal ordering kink structure. Um, so this is not the normal way you think about resolving the mass ordering. Uh, normally, you think about going to a long baseline accelerator experiment. Um, they do some very complicated analysis, which introduces matter effects. Um, and you, well, at the end of the day, you trust that they did it right uh, because they have a lot of people working on it, but it's totally non-intuitive. Uh, this is cool because if you look at the spectrum, you can actually see the kink structure if you have the statistics and the resolution. Um, uh, so, and it's, it's a totally independent way of getting the order. Uh, then also, you can uh, go after sterile neutrinos with the same technique, right? If kinks exist due to the normal mass ordering, kinks also exist if you introduce fourth sterile neutrino states. Um, this is a way that you can produce another independent cross-check of things like the reactor neutrino anomaly, the, the best gallium anomaly. Um, so there's other physics that uh, can kind of spill out of these, this program on the same time scale. So in order to leave a little bit of time for questions, I'll just wrap up with con some conclusions. Um, the neutrino mass is a really interesting question. It's really important for us as a community to go after um, because it's tied across all of these different fields. Um, so if you measure it in one place and you actually understand it, um, it tells you very interesting things to inform, double beta decay, cosmology, complete our standard model. Um, we know there's new physics there. We just need to go out and grab it. And Project 8 has been developing the Crest technique uh, as sort of the most viable way to get next generation sensitivity to this process. Um, specifically, we've demonstrated you can do the technique. Uh, we've demonstrated you can do the technique with better resolution on tritium, control your backgrounds. And now all we have to do is all of the hard work to demonstrate that it actually scales to the level and the sensitivity that you want. So this would not be possible without the work of a, a very great collaboration to work with. Um, and with that, I'll entertain questions. Thanks very much. So laser cooling at the fluxes we need is not, does not appear to be viable, mm -hmm. um, right? Like if, if you think about what the, the AMO experiments traditionally use, um, sorry, I do not have the right flux numbers off on the tip of my tongue, um, but we're, we're just problematically orders in the